And I am happy to introduce Kiersey Thierry, who is the former president of uh, ETCHA, and she will be chair for Margaret Sutherland. So, uh, Kiersey, will you please take over? Good morning, everybody. First of all, I have to say that I'm so happy to be here. I haven't been in the conference for a while, and I'm really enjoying seeing all of you and learning from you. And this morning, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce you to Dr. Margaret Sutherland uh, from Scotland. Uh, I was asked to do this yesterday, and all of you know that in this book, on page 21, you can read her bio. So please take advantage of the book. So here's information about all our keynote speakers. So I'm not going to repeat what is in the book. I wanted to make it more fun. Yesterday, I went around and I asked people, what do you know about Margaret, Margaret Sutherland? And I learned three things that I'm going to share with you now. The first thing I learned, many people said the same thing. Oh, yes, Mar Margaret Sutherland. She is the lady uh, who speaks about early years. Giftedness in early years. That's what she is very famous for. She has authored a book. How many of you have read her book? Very many, but there are still people who can, who can read it. The second thing that I was told was that Margaret is a person who knows how to put research into practice. This was something I loved. I'm a teacher educator. I educate teachers in the University of Helsinki. And this is our aim, to teach teachers how to put research into practice. And then we are coming to the third thing I learned about Margaret. And this was probably the most fascinating thing that I didn't know beforehand. Do you know that she is a dancer? She loves to dance, and that was her dream, to become a dancer. But maybe we are lucky that she made another choice, and today we can hear Margaret. So please help me to welcome Margaret Sutherland. Well, good morning. I have to say I was a little worried when Kirsty said she had asked people about me, and I wondered what had been said, but I have to confess these things are all true. So I was very happy last night when we started with a dance, Jambo, Jambo, Buana, that was fine with me. I am indeed Margaret Sutherland, and I come from Scotland. And I'm going to talk this morning about some work that we've been doing in Scotland um, in early years, but it's not just about early years, actually. It's about across education. And I'm also going to think about what some of the implications are for that in the field of gifted education and indeed in education more generally. Now, I've got a feeling this should look different. Where's, have you met Brian? Brian is wonderful. Everybody needs a Brian, yeah. Everybody needs a Brian. <laughs> Thank you. So, I work in the University of Glasgow, in the city of Glasgow in Scotland, and that is my building, one of our buildings that you can see behind me. It may, you, if you've read um, the Harry Potter series, it may bear a strong resemblance to Hogwarts. And it's thought that indeed the author of Harry Potter was very influenced by the architecture of my university. If you're in the quadrangles um, inside that building, you can just imagine the game of Quidditch being played. We had some children with us recently, and as they left, they turned and said, bye Hogwarts, we'll be back. So I like to think that myself and my colleague Neve, and we're very fortunate to have three of our PhD students with us here today at the conference too, we all uh, work in Hogwarts. Scotland is part of the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom is in the global north, and you can find your country of origin and see where we are in relation 
to where you are. But I spend my time working in schools, predominantly in Scotland, although also in England, and I had the privilege of speaking and working with teachers in Wales last year as well. Scotland. This year, the jet stream has been quite far south, and that has meant that our summer in Scotland has been wet and cold. Thank you, Denmark, for making me feel at home this morning. <laughs> I really enjoyed yesterday. It's a long time since we've seen the sunshine. But you know, the land, the geographical makeup of our country, our climate, um, the crops that we can grow, all form part of who we are. And yes, we are the land of kilts, of haggis, of whiskey, of the Loch Ness Monster, of mountains and castles. And I don't work for our tourist board, but do come and visit us. But we are all of these things. And I think that's important because you will come from countries where you have our equivalent of whiskey and the Loch Ness Monster. Not forgetting Braveheart, if you've seen Braveheart. But can I just say that's Hollywood's interpretation of Scotland. And as for Mel Gibson's Scottish accent, well, let's move on. Um, the United Kingdom is made up of four nations, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and England. And Scotland has its own parliament. Um, we do have a national parliament in Westminster, based in London, down in the south of England. Um, and it has retained matters of defense, immigration, and so on. But our devolved parliament has control over our health, our education, our law system, our legal system. We have a Scottish legal system. And those things are important, I think, to tell you and to share with you because it means that Scotland's approach to education has been in many ways a little different from other parts of the United Kingdom. So we are committed, for example, to comprehensive education. That's very important for us. 95.5% of Scottish children attend public education. Only 4.5% are in private schools, schools they pay for. Public education is very dear to us and very precious to us. And I think that's important in order to set the context for the work um, that I will go on to talk about. Um, Scotland also has free higher education at undergraduate level. If you are a Scottish domicile student, it is free. Our universities are public universities. That's important to us, and it sets a particular context that may be very different from the context that some of you come from and work in. And those are some fundamental things that I think when we go on to talk about policy and practice and research, it's important that we place them within the context in which we work. And for us, that is our context. That's the context that we are working within in Scotland. So, my colleague Neve and I work for something called the Glasgow Centre for International Development and it is located within the University of Glasgow. And in that centre, we are very, very interested in issues around poverty, um, marginalisation, and such like. And it's a cross-disciplinary group, so medicine, veterinary medicine, life sciences, psychology, arts, education, it's about all of these disciplines coming together to look at these big issues that we face in our world. And as we have worked together to discuss and share these big issues, it becomes very apparent that we're coming at them from different places. Our background, our disciplines will shape how we think, and will shape and form what we think should happen about some of these big issues. And so I think 
when you look at things like the Millennium Development Goals and now indeed the post-2015 agenda that we're grappling with and debating about, then I think we are, there's kind of tacit agreement as to what the big issues are. Climate change. I was struck how flat Denmark is. I, I, I've Danish neighbours and they had said to me, we're really enjoying being in Scotland because of the hills and the mountains. And I said, oh, okay. And as I flew in, I thought, oh, now I understand why you're really enjoying the hills and the mountains. It's very flat. What's going to happen if the sea level rises? So climate change, food security, water security. We held a conference in our university just recently. I was one of the organizers looking at these issues of food security. What does that mean for us? Linked, of course, to water security. Huge issues around water, access to clean water, a fundamental thing that we need to live, all of us. So big issues, global health. I think Ebola was mentioned last night during one of the presentations. There are other major things. And the 15 neglected tropical diseases that United Nations are now highlighting because of that very first word, neglected. So there's big, big health issues that we're grappling with and of course obesity and so on and so forth. And poverty. So we're quite clear what the issues are, but I think there's less agreement around how we actually effectively and collectively address those issues. What do we do? How do we get together and decide what we do about these big issues? And as I was thinking about this, it struck me that actually maybe that's something that's right and chimes with gifted education. If you look back conference programs or indeed look back to very, very early journal articles, do you know what? You find we were talking about identification. Do you use IQ tests? Do you not? Do you test at all or not? If you're going to test, which test? What do we test? Can you test? And you know what? We're still talking about that. And then once we found them, whatever way we decide we're going to find them, what do we do with them? Do we have them all together? Do we separate them out? Do we have them together sometimes? All the time? Never? And you know what? We're still talking about that. Parents. There was a parents' day, I think it was at Sunday we had a parents' day at conference. Parents, hugely important in all of this, not least because of the people that pop them out into the world in the first place for us to think about. But parents, part of all this process, part of us thinking about how do we meet the needs of gifted young children or gifted young learners spanning the ages from zero to whatever. And of course, linked to that environment, how does the environment help us to meet the needs and challenges that gifted young children um, display? Is it about nature or nurture? And curriculum. So we've identified them, we've got them, we've decided where they're going to educate them. What do we do with them? What kind of curriculum do we offer? So these are perennial issues, it seems to me, that we're discussing and debating. And indeed, can I say, discussing and debating in the field of special education. We could remove the title gifted education and put special education up there. They are discussing exactly the same issues for learners in special education. And it seems to me that what is less clear, and I guess that's what a conference like this is about, is about trying to decide how we effectively and collectively address the needs of gifted learners. How do we address these perennial questions that we have? Now, I'm hoping the next slide translates into whatever language, country, culture you speak. There's a little bit of a danger with humor that it doesn't translate, okay? So here goes. Dad, can you help me find the lowest common denominator in this maths problem? To which dad replies, don't tell me that they haven't found it yet. I remember looking for it when I was at school. And it does seem to me that we are looking and discussing the same things we've looked at and discussed for a long, long time. Now, that might not be problematic. That might just be how it is. 
But it is nonetheless, I think, what is happening and what we're doing. And it seems to me there is a need, therefore, to come together, researchers and practitioners and policymakers, to come together to effectively and collectively decide how are we going to meet the needs of gifted young learners. It seems to me unacceptable that conference after conference after conference, people stand up and say, and so gifted young children are neglected, and so gifted young children don't get the challenge they need, and so gifted children don't get... We have a problem. And it seems to me that maybe the way we're going about it is not particularly collectively and effectively addressing some of those problems. Oh, can one speak to me? There we go. So we've got this research policy practice. And I guess the bit that I want to really concentrate on today and talk about, and that's because it's the bit where, as Kirsty said, I spend a lot of my time working, is in the nexus, the gap, the bit between the research and the practice, and you're in the middle. And you know what? It can be a very sore place to be because sometimes the policy bangs into you and sometimes the practice bangs into you and you're a bit like that in the middle. And I became interested in that research policy practice nexus because in the late 1990s in Scotland, in fact in the UK, we became very energized about early intervention. We need to get in there early in nursery, kindergarten and do something so that we don't have these problems later on in our schools and in society. Based, of course, on the studies in the USA and Ypsilanti and so on. If you're familiar with those studies, you'll know that economists jumped on this idea. For every dollar you spend there, you'll save seven over there. That's a compelling argument if you're a politician. So governments jumped on this idea, and on one level it was great. It raised the profile of early years. Fantastic, some of us who'd been working in early years for a number of years thought. But there's still an issue over what we did, I think, certainly in Scotland. But anyway, one of the things we did was we used to get practitioners together and we used to get along people to speak with them and work with them and talk about early intervention and early years. And I was invited to go and speak at one of these events. There was about maybe 150, 200 um, early years educators, some of them were teachers, they weren't all teachers, but they were all working in the field of early years. And the start of the morning, I was the second speaker after coffee, and the first lady was speaking, and she got up, and I watched the audience, and she said five words, opening five words. And in those opening five words, I watched her lose between 60 and 70% of her audience. Would you like to know what the five words were? She said, good morning. So far, so good. They were still with her. Good morning. I'm a researcher. I watched shuffling of papers. I watched, do you get this in your country? The look that says, and what will you be able to tell us? the rolling of eyes, or just that kind of glazing over. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear. I also thought, how interesting. And why is that happening? Why does it happen that it seems that research and practice have become uneasy bedfellows? The 40, 30 to 40% she hadn't lost she lost a little later in her talk. <laughs> she had been looking at, she'd been tracking children who'd been at kindergarten or nursery and children who hadn't. And she was testing them. We were doing baseline assessment anyway, and she was doing some kind of baseline assessment in order to say, well, if they come in knowing all this stuff and then they enter our formal school system, what happens by the time it gets to Christmas when they've had a term in formal schooling? Surely we must see children progressing and children moving on and so on. And there were tentative findings in her report at this point. But she said, now remember this is an audience of people who work with young children. She said, and so when we looked at the results, 
actually, although children came in for nursery and they were here, by the time we got to Christmas, there had been a washout effect. They might as well not have been in nursery. And the other 30 to 40% that she'd had with her up until then, went off. You know, you've kind of said, so you're all just wasting your time. This was not a good way, I didn't think, of engaging practitioners in thinking about and using and realizing research is crucial and vital if we are going to develop practice. The feeling of despair and despondency was palpable. You could feel it at the coffee break. And it was my job to get up and speak next. <laughs> now, I have to confess, I played on it a little. I used six words. I said, good morning, I was a teacher. <laughs> but do you know what, that equally worried me and frightened me because I looked and I thought, actually, I've probably got about 80% of you because you never get everybody all the time. I've probably got 80% of you in the palm of my hand. I suspect I can now say whatever I want and you'll just go, oh yeah, yeah because she knows what it is, she knows what it's like. That's dangerous. We need to be developing learners and teachers that will question and critique and analyze from a position of knowledge and understanding about pedagogy, about research and about theory and about learning and about teaching. To analyze what they're being asked to do, whether it be national policy, school policy or whatever. So I got really interested in this apparent gap that exists. And I talked about in the title of today, the idea of building bridges. This is one of our bridges. We have lots of bridges, and I noticed flying into Denmark and coming on the train, you've got lots of bridges too. You'll all come from a country with a bridge of some kind. So that kind of analogy, I think, works. But this is one of our bridges, the fourth rail bridge. The fourth rail bridge was completed in 1891. It was the first big steel structure of its kind built in the UK. It has just in the last couple of months gained UNESCO World Heritage status. It's an important bridge, we like it. It's quite a pretty bridge actually as bridges go. But it was built at a time that served a purpose. It took the people who lived around the city of Edinburgh and enabled them to quickly access the Kingdom of Fife and the north of Scotland. It built a bridge across the River Forth, hence the name Forth Rail Bridge, because it was a railway bridge. And it epitomized the transport system at the time. It was about railways. If we come back to this idea of research, I think there's been a lot of criticism, not just within the field of educa gifted education, but in education generally, about education research. Criticism leveled at the quality of it, the rigor of it, and within some quarters within gifted education, raising questions about the lack of scientific rigor and a theoretical research. Now, we can debate and discuss that, and no doubt we will over the course of the next four days. But this idea that there is this disjoint, the theme of this conference is about research and practice, so it suggests there is something here that we need to and want to, and indeed I would argue must discuss about this apparent disjoint between what we know we should do and then what we actually do. And it can be quite a big river and a big gulf to span, I think. So this disjoint, this idea of bridges joining up these two bits, um, I think one of the issues too, though, is why is it that the research has got this kind of bad press, if you like, with practitioners? And I think it's quite interesting if you look in the 19th century as research was developing. Predominantly women in education. Was it seen as women's work? Is it still seen as women's work? So there's some issues in there around research, the history of research, how it grew up. There's also some big questions I think we need to ask about the kind of research because it very much became about a scientific model that we adopted. And dare I say a very westernized, in fact, UK, USA model of research that we have borrowed or we have developed rather and have tried to kind of share 
That may be appropriate, it may not. But I think the researchers would traditionally generate the knowledge that then practitioners were left to do. And I think we also have tried in education, we draw on so many disciplines, psychology, philosophy, anthropology, sociology. In fact, maybe that's education's problem. Maybe it's because we're not an ology. Maybe we have called ourselves educationology. <laughs> it would have been better. Because it does seem to me that sometimes, in particular academic institutions, the value of education and teacher education is not that highly regarded, perhaps. That might be a problem. And we're drawing on these different disciplines to try and shine a light on practice in our classrooms with young children, with learners, in order to better understand what we're doing. But we're coming from very different places to try and understand this notion of practice, the applied notion. And indeed, maybe it's that applied idea that also causes us problems in this research practice nexus. I think we tried to mirror scientific research in order to make them like us. We'll do what they do. I'm just not sure it's as easy as that. I think education is lots of different bits. It maybe needs lots of different mirrors to understand what we're doing and what each part can contribute to that bigger idea of learning. So, my bridge. It was built at a particular time. Railway was the mode of, tra rail was the mode of transport. By the 1960s, we all had cars in Scotland. We're quite advanced, you know. We all had cars. We needed another way to bring Edinburgh and the rest of Scotland across this gulf that is the River Forth. And so we built another bridge, the Forth Road Bridge. Quite a pretty bridge. So we've now got two bridges. We didn't do away with the rail one. We just built another one that we also needed. With its roots in Edinburgh and the other side, or its roots on the other side, it depends which side you're on, where you think the roots are. But both sides, where this, the starting and end point of the bridges are the same place. We have research, we have schools and practice, different ways into it, perhaps. We need to look at that and think about that. Not to do away with one, because I am not saying that traditional approach into research is wrong, I'm just saying it's one way. I don't know if you're familiar with John Law's book called After Method, Mess in Social Science Research. And he is starting to challenge some of the traditional methodological hegemony out there. Talking about the irregular, because we're talking about human beings. He says that this is not to say that dominant social science research practice is wrong, and I'm not saying that either, so don't come and get me later. <laughs> but that perhaps the human aspect and the often individualistic nature of teaching raises questions as the, to the normatives that are attached to them in the discourse and method. Perhaps we need to be thinking about some of these things as we engage in the practice and as we engage in the research and as we think about how we bring these two bits closer together. I graduated in 1981. You'll understand I was very young. This bit of research was done in 1981, and it talked about this disjoint, teachers developing their own theories. It's easy to communicate to other teachers. Oh, I understand what you're saying. A bit like I was saying that this group of teachers, oh, she'll know she's one of us. So we can communicate easily to each other. Classroom practices and policies are frequently based on teachers' theories and judgments. But I have some problems if that's all practice is about. I think that theory without the practice is actually a bit useless. But I actually think practice without the theory might be dangerous. I think we need to think about ways of bringing these two bits together. And back to my bridges. So we had the rail bridge, the road bridge, and now there's so many people in Scotland with cars that we need another bridge. 
because the one bridge we had wasn't enough. And we're in the, that's an artist's impression. It's still being built. We flew out of Edinburgh on Sunday, and I looked down and thought, yep, we're still building it. Um, that's an artist's impression. But we're going to have a third bridge called the Queen's Ferry Bridge. We had a national competition to name our bridge, and it's known as the Queen's Ferry, because originally there was a ferry. A little boat went between the two bits of land. So the Queen's Ferry Bridge is currently being built. We know that... For example, research councils now are asking for evidence of collaboration in research bids. And that doesn't mean, as we were explaining to a group of um, academics we were working with one day, that doesn't mean a doctor that knows about your heart working with a doctor that knows about your lungs. That's still within the same discipline. But they're looking for true interdisciplinary research. And we know that in education literature, there's been a call for collaboration, true collaboration, not just getting together and getting to know each other and applying for a grant, but true collaboration, where researchers and practitioners are working together to make things better for learners. And that gulf that exists between research and practice, perhaps this push for collaboration will help us to, to um, bridge that gulf. It, when we set it up as a binary tension between research and practice, we create a them and a us. And perhaps that's not really so helpful either. So we've been working at looking at models of collaboration because it's easy to say, but we would argue hard to do. And neither myself were working with an education authority with early years staff elementary or primary staff, and secondary staff. And we were looking at ways to, um, to, to, to help them know how to challenge gifted and talented children. We call them highly able, by the way, in Scotland, not additional support for learning. We've moved away from a deficit compensatory pedagogy model towards a complementary pedagogy model that is a different, philosophically different way of thinking about learning and supporting individuals. And for us, it was crucial and vital, and we were so pleased that it includes gifted and talented. So we have a, 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 a policy and, and legislation called Getting It Right for Every Child. Had it not included gifted, it could not have called itself that, because it should have been getting it right for some children. Gifted education has to be in there, it, for me, it has to be at the table along with everything else. It's not something out there, separate, different, after school and so on. It has to be in there, embedded into our system. And I was really pleased that we were part of the group of all of our initial teacher education institutions that came together to develop that framework. Because gifted education's voice was at the table. Not just at it, feet under it. I didn't let them away with much. So, they got to reflect on their personal views. Your own personal view of what high ability is will have been influenced by your experiences. What do you think it is? What do you think it isn't? They had a chance to think about that. Vitally important, I would argue, if practitioners are going to then think about models and theories that we have in gifted education and how they apply in the context in which you find yourself. They liked that the task was clear. Why was it clear? It was clear because collectively we had discussed what the task was. They weren't told, we've got a phrase in Scotland, yufty, yufty do that, you have to, you have to, I'll do a wee bit of translation here, you have to do that, yufty do that, <laughs> okay? So it wasn't a yufty, that's a phrase we would use in Scotland, okay? It was a, let's work on this together. What are the big principles and how do we put them into practice in our context? They enjoyed working together. They enjoyed working with each other. They worked in the same authority. They worked in the same kinds of schools, but they'd never spoken to each other because they never get an opportunity. That was hugely empowering and liberating for them to be doing that. They liked the think, plan, do, evaluate, then think, plan, do kind of model. This also links well, this was about gifted education, this links well to what we're asking teachers to do about education and learning and teaching generally 
in Scotland. We're trying to develop an all master's level workforce for better or worse, that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to engage them in that notion of career lifelong professional development learning. So when I left in college, in 19, and it was college, not university, in 1981, that was it, I was a teacher. Hey, I know what I'm going out there to do. I'd like to go back and apologize to my first class. <laughs> Knowing what I know now, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I did this, I should have done that. <laughs> but we all change and develop and evolve and grow. And we are making sure, or trying to make sure, our teachers leave us knowing that they've only just done the first part of this learning thing. They're going to have to continue to do that throughout their professional life, and they need to do it by engaging with research, not just looking at the practice. Oh, and the other bit, just very quickly. I loved that one, two, three, fourth bullet point. Theory clearly linked to practice, building on practitioners' own expertise. This is a quote, beyond the university's ivory tower. Because there is that, oh, you're away up there in your ivory tower. You don't know what it's like down there in practice. Do you know, to a certain extent, that's true. Long time since I taught full time in a classroom. I've still got skills that I can kind of, I've got the look. Do you do the teacher look, eh, young lady? You know, that voice, that... You know? um, I don't know where you get it, but you kind of acquire it, don't you? The look, you know. Um, I've still got that. <laughs> but I'm not working day and daily with our curriculum framework. Why am I the best person to know what they should be doing? I'm not. But I do know something. I don't know nothing. But when we bring it together, surely there's strength for research and for practice to come together in order that both develop and become stronger and become better. So developing practice that's rooted in collective local community engagement with understanding of the adjacent environment for us is important because it responds to what they face on a daily basis. Differing belief systems will impact on what happens. That's a picture of the world upside down. Imagine if we really started to build these bridges between research and practice. Imagine if practice started to influence research and research started to influence practice in a way that I think actually is what we're trying to do. Just imagine if it worked. It may well just turn the world upside down. It may find us challenging some of the neoliberal agenda out there within our higher education institutions. It may find us challenging all sorts of things that need to be challenged. Not just for gifted education, but for education more generally. The bridges. That's the building of our third bridge, the Queen's Ferry one. And notice that it's coming from both sides. It's not starting in our capital city side and going to the nether regions of the Kingdom of Fife. It's emerging from both sides. Research and practice need to come together. We need to start to engage in ways that help us to understand each other. Wouldn't you just hate if that was your project? <laughs> Tempted to jump off, I think. Um, but of course, we can come together. But unless there is real collaboration, real understanding of where a researcher is coming from and where a practitioner is coming from, there's a danger that that is indeed what happens. We just kind of miss. A bit of touching, but not the complete joining, dovetailing that I think we're striving towards, and the dovetailing that's maybe necessary if we are to end up not continually talking about the things we keep talking about at every conference. Teaching Scotland's future that I mentioned earlier, Donaldson is talking about this idea of developing these teachers, not just teachers for the gifted, absolutely we need them, but teachers for everybody that can reflect and think and practice and research and theory and understanding and pedagogy and all these kinds of things. Find your language and apologies if yours isn't there. We need to think about how we ask better questions. We need researchers to be asking other researchers about what they do and having a deeper understanding. We need practitioners to talk to other practitioners to have a deeper understanding of what they're doing. And we need researchers and practitioners to talk and exchange 
with each other. Practitioners are not passive recipients, or at least they shouldn't be. It's important that we dialogue, that we talk, and that we discuss. We need to be asking the right questions in order to get some answers. I want to tell you a story about a 12-year-old girl. This 12-year-old girl, girl came to work with Neve and I at the University of Glasgow with the rest of her class. There were about 30 children, just back there in June. She came from a school in an area of deprivation, high unemployment, high drugs, high crime rates, high alcohol problems, low aspirations. And the school had been tracking their gifted and talented children. Actually, no, let me rephrase. The school had been tracking all of their children to see what happened to them five years down the line when they finished secondary school. And many of them who showed that spark, that potential that was mentioned last night in, in the first keynote address, it seemed to fizzle out. And the primary school are worried about that. And one of the things they decided to do was to raise aspirations and they said, can we come to the university? We want the children in our school to know they can get on a train and a bus and get there. We're talking something like eight miles. Some of these children had never been out of that housing estate. To go to Hogwarts was just something that just is not in your head. So they came to the university. Almost 82 years to the day that Einstein had been awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Glasgow. And when you come out having graduated, you'll do that later, girls, PhD students are down here, you'll do that soon. You come out with your doctorate and you walk round one of those Quidditch tri uh, quadrangles and we were saying to the children, you're walking in the very footsteps that Einstein, you're treading in his footsteps. That was dead cool, they thought. They knew who Einstein was. We got into one of our big lecture theatres where they'd spent the morning listening to academics and other workers in the university too, um, other lots of jobs in universities, not just academic jobs, and they had been listening to these people. And this 12-year-old girl looked Neve and I in the eye, and she said, do you know something? No one in my family's ever gone to university before. They didn't get the grades. I'm going to change that. seems to me that's kind of what we're after. That idea of change. We need to stop looking, I think, for the magic bullet. In education, in gifted education, I just don't think it's there. I think we need to engage we, us, and I include myself in this, need to engage social injustice when we see it. We need to challenge and change systems that perpetuate marginalization and discrimination when we see them. I think we have to do that. I think we owe it to our societies to do that. And I think, you know, if you follow the European news at all, you'll know that there is there are migrants crossing across the Mediterranean. It's happening in other parts of the world too. Um, and they're landing on our European shores, hoping for a better life than the chaos and devastation that they've left behind. And recently in the UK, there's been a lot in the news and the press about the group of migrants in Calais in northern France wanting to come through the Channel Tunnel to the UK. If Europe's only response to that is to build a higher wall with sharper razor wire, I think we have a problem. I think we need to be raising up a generation that will challenge and change higher walls and razor wire. We need to raise up a generation that will challenge and change the idea that you pick up a gun before you sit down and talk. We need to raise up a generation that will challenge the systems and structures that see some making bucket loads of money and others living in poverty. We need to grow a generation that challenges and changes the fact that on Friday afternoon when I switched on my radio, I was told I could employ a water sommelier who will sell me a bottle of water for 35 euros. While at the same time we have children dying from waterborne diseases because they don't have access to clean, fresh water. We need to grow a generation that will challenge and change 
systems and structures. As we spend the next four days here in conference, we're going to talk to each other, we're going to learn lots of things, we're going to share lots of ideas, and we might even argue. And that's okay. But I hope as we get on the train or however you're getting out of Olansa, I've been practicing all that, all that word all year, was that right? Olansa. As we leave Olansa, I hope we go with the words of that 12-year-old girl ringing in our ears, going back to our education system saying, I'm going to change that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret, for this inspiring talk. And now we have time for the questions and comments. And let's stick to the four questions. Who wants to be the first? Anybody? <laughs> this is your chance. Use it. Here we have, yes. Okay. Good night. Uh, oh, good morning. Uh, I came from Brazil, and um, I was uh, your your speech make me uh, reflect on our country because um, we have. I think we have different problems. Uh, but also related with that uh, lack of bridge between practice and research and politics. And, uh, but I think uh, that one, one thing we have to, to, to change, especially in uh, South American countries, uh, is the way education is, view, is viewed. Because uh, in South America, education means waste not investment. So when you say uh, we have different, we haven't uh, a bridge between practice and research, I noticed that because I am res a, res a researcher, but um, teachers has no time to study. Governments don't allow teachers to have time to study. They have to study on their own at the weekends, paying for it for the, for, with their own money. So it's very difficult to develop a researcher in a teacher. Uh, and also, uh, gifted education is uh, still uh, far away because uh, governments sought Deficient people, disabled people are more vulnerable than gifted people. So I think these are uh, two things we have to face. Yeah. First, uh, consider education as an investment and uh, really place money on it, place time on it mm -hmm. and uh, allow teachers to research yeah. and uh, consider gifted as vulnerable as disabled people, yeah. because they are. Yeah. And I think that was a statement rather than a question, and I think I agree with you. <laughs> um, also, can I say, we, don't, we haven't got this right in Scotland yet. We've not sussed it. Um, we may be small um, in terms of population number, but we, we haven't kind of cracked this. But I think our system um, at the moment is at least asking some of these hard questions. Um, but we're going through a time of austerity and budgets are being cut. But interestingly, for the first time ever, budgets are being cut around the whole idea of a support for learning. And so we're actually cutting money from the traditional group who are thought of as vulnerable, the disabled and so on. And that goes right the way through to when you're a disabled adult, we've been cutting benefits and all sorts of things. So I think, and one of the things, the debates and discussions we're having in Scotland and in Scottish society is around how do we create 
a fairer society for everybody. And by virtue of the fact we're talking about everybody, we have to also be talking about gifted and talented. So I agree it's difficult. Now I feel terrible because I don't want to take a question from somebody else. Um, in terms of replicating what you've done in our own countries, how did you build the bridges to get all these people at the table to discuss research and practice? Give us some nitty gritty tips to how to make it happen Is that for the, ourselves. The teachers or the policy bit or both? Every bit. How Every do you bit. get all, how do you get, um, that's my question. How do you get people talking? Okay, we, we got people talking from the policy bit it because um, for a long time, those of us working in support for learning, in the traditional idea of it, as in those with difficulties and so on, had um, decided it was important. We were working and talking about and researching in the field of collaboration, influenced by Etienne Wenger's work and so on, and we were saying, well, we can't all sit in our own institutions and talk about this if we don't actually all come together and talk about it. And so we came together as a group, um, the seven initial teacher education institutions in Scotland, and I appreciate our size allows us maybe to do that. But we came together in order to talk about um, how we could influence policy and what we were actually doing in our institutions with regards to teacher education. We went through a phase when um, teacher colleges were then merged into universities and there was quite a bit of a different agenda in universities and that whole kind of neoliberal competition element crept in a little bit and we were seen to be in competition with each other. You know, come to my university, it's better than the one down the road, whoa. Um, and we've got all that league table stuff and so on. Um, but interestingly, those of us working in support for learning, um, we kind of... Actually, what I didn't tell you was they also started building a tunnel under the River Forth at one point to try to join the sides. And I think what we did in support for learning was actually decide, oh, to hang with that, that's a good Scottish phrase, to hang with that. We're not going to engage in that nonsense as we, well, that's probably, it's not nonsense, but sorry. I take those words back. We're not going to engage in that approach. <laughs> um, we're going to come together because we believe it's important. And so we actually um, just met and didn't, this is being recorded, isn't it? Oops, I was going to say we didn't tell our universities where we went. <laughs> um, we, we just met and we did it anyway. We decided we wanted to change it. Um, in relation to the, the project we did with the, the teachers and the education authority, we, um, the, the head of the, um, the teacher part of the education authority used to work with us in the university in the Scottish Network for Able Pupils that, that Neve and I um, are, are directors of. And she was our bridge into that education authority. Um, you need, I think, to get um, like-minded individuals who are willing to think about, take risks, to challenge the status quo, and to say, come on in, let's see what we can do. Um, and we had teachers who were crying out for help. Help, I've got this child. You know, they're eight, but working like a 12 year old. What did I do with them? <laughs> There's nothing more powerful than need to make you go and find a solution to something. And so we had teachers gathered around the table who were passionately interested in education, passionately interested in changing practice and wanted to know how to do it better. Um, and so that we, we got them together. And, and when you get people like that together, you just need a bit of guidance. You need some of that stuff, Cassidy's work on co uh, collaboration, because it, it kind of happens in front of your eyes. It's one of the most exciting things to see happening. Is that helpful? I know there were other questions, and please feel free to come up and grab me later and to challenge some of the things I've said. I'm very aware it's my context, and you need to ask how does it translate into your context, if it does. Okay, as a chair, I need to take care of the schedule. So, the mo we have a coffee break, so I'm sure that Margaret will answer your questions if you have more questions after this session. But now it's time to thank her and give her the presents. Uh, and I'm giving one uh, on behalf of the World Council for Gifted Children, so she will get this wonderful book by Hans Christian Andersen with the uh, stories. This other one is from the local conference committee. We're so pleased that you are with us this morning. And I'm going to shake it and you get 
one guess, two guess, <laughs> words in it. <laughs> yes, and now we have the coffee break. Yes, coffee break. The coffee break. <laughs>